Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel Houseplanty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So today I've got a very special video for you all. I managed to get a really awesome invite to a new glass house that recently started up in the UK. It's based in Cambridgeshire. And it is one of, if not the, one of the first glass houses for tropical houseplants in the UK. I know for a lot of us that live in the UK, the majority of the houseplants that we get or we find in the market are either going to come from predominantly from the Netherlands or from the Far East or Central or South America. This is actually a company that's growing houseplants tropical houseplants in the UK, which is kind of cool. And it doesn't just stop there. They also focus on kind of sustainability and being as kind of eco-friendly as they can possibly be. It's a company called Geb and Green. I'm going to be talking to a wonderful person called Kate. And Kate will tell us a bit more about the actual space itself. And it was just an amazing, I'm filming this after the visit, essentially, but it was just an amazing day. I was kind of, I think, hit in a candy shop. It was so much fun. I've been wanting to go to a kind of space like that for a long time. And I hopefully asked a lot of the questions that a lot of you would have out there. So we touched on kind of what makes the company unique, the kind of plants that they grow there. I have got epic B roll for this video. So I'll be interspersing it throughout the video as clips, but I will also have a B-roll at the very end, as I always do for most of my videos. So check that out as well. And yeah, some tips and tricks from an actual commercial grower. And the interesting thing I find with this company, Kevin Green, is that they don't actually just sell to businesses. They also sell direct to consumer, which doesn't happen very often. And especially for all of us that kind of are aware, not just of kind of carbon footprint of getting plants to us, but also of the least amount of touch points that a plant would have before it gets to us means the less amount of stress it will have before it gets to us. This is the one. Obviously, it goes without saying, but I will say it. This isn't sponsored. This was something that I was just invited to. And I jumped at the opportunity because how often do you get to see the inside of a commercial glass house? It was awesome. But before I kind of like just get a bit too overexcited, let's have a look at the chat slash interview. So I'm here at the Gebbin Green Grow House, technically. Glass house. Glass house, there we go. And I have got Kate and I'll let Kate introduce herself. Hi there, I'm Kate. I am one of the co-founders of Gevin Green, where sustainability is at the heart of everything we do. Nice. And you can probably see around and I'll try to add little clips throughout the video because I know that you're all going to want to see what's happening in here and mm -hmm. look at all the plants. We're actually, if I'm not mistaken, in the section with the younger We plants. are, yeah. Slightly warmer temperature in here to get them established. Nice. Very, very cool. And for people that might not know about Gevin Green, I'll kind of let Kate Give us a bit of a background, maybe how you started, sure. what makes it different, all of these things. Yeah, so um, here at the glass houses, um, traditionally we were growing ornamental flowers. So we were full of lilies about nice. 18 months ago. Um, again, sustainability has always been at the heart of everything we do. And obviously when you harvest the lilies, the growing medium stays in the glass house. Yep. So we have our own sterilizing facility. That growing medium is popped in a steriliser. Mm -hmm. It is sterilised only by steam, nice. no chemicals, no gas, and it comes out fully recyclable. Nice. So we thought, hold on, the houseplant industry is full of peat, mm -hmm. which we are not. We don't use that at all in our growing nice. medium. That's new. <laughs> and there's a huge opportunity to really have a positive environmental impact. Yeah? Nice, nice. And can I ask a question about the peats? and how it's recycled, if that's all right. Absolutely. Cool. So you obviously mentioned that you use steam. 
And kind of what does the steam achieve? Does it take off any pathogens, bugs, things like that? Absolutely. It takes out any pests. Nice. So it's a purely sterile environment. Nice. Um, in terms of when we pot up the house plants, we then add a little bit of perlite, nice. um, a little bit of a wetting agent to help with that water retention, which mm. is a key learning curve over that heat wave of last <laughs> summer. Uh, Good to know. <laughs> yeah. and, and a slow release fertilizer goes in there as well. Nice, nice. So actually, that in itself makes you unique to a lot of the plants that are out there because. Very rarely when I go to an actual plant shop do I actually find perlite already in there or even slow release fertilizer. It's starting to get there, but you're obviously quite unique in that respect as well. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. I mean, we have been utilizing that growing medium for eight years yes. with the with the lilies. So yeah, tried and tested. Good, good, good. And so obviously sustainability and kind of being as eco-friendly as possible is a big thing. Yeah, here. it's huge. So um Heat is just the most precious resource um, for the environment. Peatlands only actually cover 3% of the land surface. Wow. However, they store twice as much carbon as all of the forests combined, nice. the global forests. And I don't think most people know this, actually. No. Did anybody else know this? Let us know down in the comments below. Definitely. And I think everyone go back to their biology lessons. Mm -hmm. We all understand about the photosynthesis process and the fact that trees capture carbon. Mm -hmm. And you don't think of actually what's going on below our feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And that's really key to learn as well. I don't know. I know some of my followers aren't necessarily based in the UK. I'd be really interested to see if anything like this is happening in your part of the world. But I know in the UK, just thinking about kind of traditional garden centers as well, a lot of the peat compost is now being removed. I don't think they're going to be able to sell that's compost right. with peat after certain 2024 years. 2024 is yeah. the, uh, yeah, the announced date for amateur gardeners. For amateur gardeners, so yeah. So commercial growers can still continue oh, using peats and they are pushing back the date that they are going to announce that change so and you're ahead of the curve by a lot there <laughs> absolutely but not only ahead of the curve we have we have proved that you don't need peat no, exactly. to grow you exactly. know it, it's, it's just totally unnecessary it's doing having a massive detrimental impact mm. on the environment and if we're ever going to get to the climate change targets yeah this is going to be really crucial in doing that yeah and i mean keep in mind as well there's something that we're kind of not talking about but it's kind of there tropical plants being grown <laughs> commercially in the uk and i know there are a lot of tropical plant kind of glass houses as well that are in the netherlands but as far as i'm aware you're one of the first ones to be growing tropicals yeah we believe in the UK. so yeah. yeah yeah so that's impressive and little top tip for the people that are based in the uk these are pre-hardened to our conditions to a certain point as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we heat the glass house. You mentioned yeah, it earlier. Yeah. So our nursery side yeah. is slightly warmer. Mm -hmm. um, once those plants are more established, they do go into the cooler area of the glass house. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they're not going to have that massive shock when they yeah. come to your house. And hopefully I'll add a little clip here as well. And if Kate will allow me, there is a little thermometer there that I saw the temperature and I was shocked by how low that actually was, which means they should be more than suited for most houses even in the energy crisis yeah so yeah. And, we, and you know we've had lower temperatures than that that, yeah, yeah. that really cold spell that we had only a few weeks ago yeah um yeah our plants we were a little bit worried but absolutely no problems they did well yeah mm -hmm. and this is the thing as well like there is something to be said not just here obviously it depends on where you are in the world if you can grow if you can buy locally grown plants like this they've a lot of the times been through all of the weather conditions uh, so you were talking about the the cold yeah. snap that we had recently you mentioned briefly the heat wave as well that we had yeah, in the summer they experienced those fluctuations yeah yeah sure. they've, they've all been through the same thing so they're as much as possible at least in my opinion probably a bit more pre-hardened yes. to yes. <laughs> to growing here however we did have a uh, air source heat pump fitted in nice. that cold spell my plants did not like that <laughs> uh, did dry out the air too much yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had some shock. I was say, but you know, we were minus temperatures, which yeah, is which obviously is, not what you would do. Not what you want yeah. generally. But do you know? Do you monitor anything like humidity in here? Yes, we do. So we have an automated misting system. Cool. The rainwater for that is collected from the roof, and we also have a um, spring-fed reservoir on site nice. as well if we need to. But yeah, it's automated. So when humidity levels drop, those misting systems will kick in. Nice, nice. And that's the thing as well. So. It's not just that you're doing one thing that's sustainable. You, you've talked about 
the peat free soil you talked about air source heat pumps you've talked about the misting system that's my house just to clarify ah, okay <laughs> <laughs> so here well, how does so it heat it here? within the glass house we are we're heating it mm -hmm. on a biomass heater nice. and Still. so we're burning wood chip and mm -hmm. that's on the government approved rhi scheme nice. so absolutely no gas. nice so again bonus yep this is the thing as well like and i and i like talking to individuals in businesses like yours as well because you're not just doing one thing and just saying we're green you're actually yeah as we're much as you possibly can basically we're yeah we're, we're not perfect but mm -hmm. we're kind of trying coin and, and capitalize on that phrase progression rather than perfection yeah, yeah. so yeah biomass boiler yeah capture the rainwater led lights nice. which are used in a very limited capacity mm -hmm. but they are leds so energy efficient yeah yeah, yeah. Nice, yeah, and uh, LEDs are a necessity in the winter, I think, at some point or another in the UK. <laughs> uh, for the people that are not from here, it's grey a lot of the year. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty miserable. <laughs> <laughs> but anything else you want to say about the kind of grow operation that you have here? No, I think it's just the fact that we just want to shout about things can be done differently. Mm. We are 97% peat free. We are recycling a waste medium, sterilizing it and growing these beautiful green house plants and Ooh. the key is there is no compromise you are getting really good quality plants with no extra costs nice. the pricing of these plants are comparable yeah. and this is the thing as well that we were talking about this just before we started filming actually and it's really interesting because you'd assume if something is grown locally or it's kind of as eco-friendly as it possibly be or sustainable in that respect you kind of assume that by default i mean most people i think would assume that it's going to be more expensive yeah but actually it's not no and we we don't want people to feel that they have to pay more to protect the environment here you can do a simple switch and give yourself a pat on the back nice which is great basically so i mean at the end of the day if the pricing is the same and you can find them as easily as each other, why wouldn't you want to get an option that's a bit more green and it's a bit more local as well? I think you were sharing, we were talking again about this just before we started filming, about um, how much energy it takes to just get a single rose yes. over to the yeah, UK. I know with Valentine's Day had just been recently. Yeah, so, yeah. And so you're talking about yeah the, the lighting requirements, the water requirements, and then obviously the carbon footprint of shipping it from the likes of Kenya, Ecuador, Colombia. Yeah, yeah. So, same. Yeah. This is a much more feasible option. And not just that, here. these will last, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would imagine most people's Valentine's roses are probably dead already. Probably, yes. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, cool. So maybe I'm just really curious about the, the kind of team in general. And maybe maybe let's start with more of a personal question to you. What was your first house plant when you were first getting into? My first house plant. So when we were trialing plants in here, I had a whole tray. <laughs> um, I was like, right, okay, this is the challenge. We're going to see if they can grow in here. Can they grow in my in my house as well? So um, one of my favourites out of those, and it still is, is the Pilea Moon Valley. Nice. It's just such a beautiful texture, that vibrant green, mm -hmm. and it's still going strong. Nice. <laughs> and see, this is the thing I always talk about on my channel as well. It's it, what works for different people. For instance, the the Pileas one that I tried and it did well for me, but then at some point I'm just like, I oh, know I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I've done something wrong <laughs> the way, but it's doing great for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So it's lean into your strengths, people, as much as you possibly I think can. That's it. And everyone's yeah. home environment's it's different, be different yeah. and we all forget to water at times yeah. um, or overwater at other times. So I think it's just about kind of getting to know your plants yeah, and, yeah. and reading them because they they do give you signs. Yeah, and, and this is the thing, yeah, and there, there is a thing, and we've talked about it on the channel before, there are expressive plants as well. So the easiest one I can think of is the peace lily, which will throw oh, the biggest yeah. <laughs> hissy fit. It will just faint mm. because it just needs a bit of water. It just got a tiny bit thirsty, and as soon as you give it some water, it will perk right back up, which there is something to be said about the value of plants like that, especially if you're just starting out because... There's less of the guessing game. The plant kind of tells yeah, you what absolutely. it is. Yeah, yeah. It talks to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, So it is one of those things. But I'd be really curious. I don't know whether or not you know maybe some of the teams, the people that work here, yep. what are some of their favourites are? Yes. So some of the retro classics are favourites here. Um, you're talking, obviously, of social media, Instagrammable Monsteras. We have a couple of really big ones that we've grown from trial when we very first started out. So they're very precious. Mm -hmm. um, 
But lots of the interesting calathias mm -hmm. are actually um, a, a real hit. We've got some new ones growing at the moment. Just mm -hmm. behind us, we have the network. Nice. Um, so lots of the different colours and patterns oh, are, yeah. are definitely coming through. Which is good. That's awesome. And do you, based on the fact that <laughs> you're probably growing at a much larger scale than any of the rest of us would be, yeah. which would you say are the easier ones and the harder ones? So I think for me, the easier plants are the ones that are able to cope with different light conditions. Mm -hmm. So some geniums are really good. So they tolerate quite good shade. We've touched on the monstera, but obviously the large leaves allow the photosynthesis. And then spider plant. And you can't go wrong with a spider no. plant, can you? <laughs> and it's you nice can overwater a bit, you can neglect it, and it's very and it's still happy. Fine, yeah. yeah. And it's nice to see them coming back into the market because I remember five, six years ago when I was starting my collection of four kind of nostalgia's sake there was always a spider plant growing yep. when i was growing up and i was a kid at home and i wanted to buy a spider plant i know everybody always just gets pups from like yes. friends and family yeah. but at that point four or five years ago buying a spider plant was probably rarer than some of the rare plants on the market now nobody was selling them at that point so it's nice to yeah. see them going back into the market and a bit we've more. got four different varieties in here as well nice. so, yeah very yeah. very cool <laughs> I didn't even know there was four different varieties. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's but this is the interesting thing as well because and this is coming from somebody who's growing at scale basically. So that is kind of important. And yeah, obviously lighting, maybe it's unique to the UK at least because I think this is a good day. You can see how great it is. <laughs> and we still have the shades covered. Yeah, yeah, and there's shade, yeah. This is the other thing that is probably worth noting. There's shading over the top of us as well, because even now there is a chance that if there's too much of a bright light, yeah. especially for the younger plants. And I think I think that's kind of, people think, oh, I've got a house plant, it needs lots of light, I'll stick it on my windowsill. No. Actually, they don't always need as much light as you no. would anticipate. No, no, no. And again, I think this is something that people that have been around for the videos have probably seen the challenges that I had in the conservatory with this when I was putting the shade cloth in because I was buying really horrendous kind of netting kind of shade cloths that you would get. And I'm, just, I'm just in a conservatory. I'm not in a greenhouse. I don't need to have like 90% shade, 30% nearly fried my plants, 50% nearly fried my plants, 70% nearly fried my plants. Everything's on 90% now. <laughs> so just to give you an indication of how much l the light isn't as bright as you might think it might be, basically. Yeah, I think these exactly are, right. yeah. And, and although we do have the LED lights, they are only over a specific plants mm -hmm. and very intermittently. We yeah, really yeah. do. Again, from an energy perspective, we save yeah. where we can. Yeah, and also in all fairness, that probably makes them a bit hardier as well because if you think about things that might be coming from further afield, I'm thinking about the kind of Far East or Central or South America. I mean, they can control it with shade cloths, but I would imagine for the majority of the year, they're getting an awful lot of light, basically. And then we're shipping these plants over to places like the UK, which is a lot grayer. They need to acclimate to our lighting conditions. The plants in here... Already pretty there. much there, yeah. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah. <laughs> they don't need to be done in any other way. But yeah, and I think any kind of specific plant that you have very fond memories when you first started setting up Gibbon Green? Let me have a think. We have a range of spikers in, and I have struggled with that a bit with that, but I am on a learning journey, <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure if it's definitely fond memories, memories, maybe slight frustrations. That's fine. It's, that's all right. Mm. To be fair, I'm, I can't keep a ficus alive to save my life. Mm. I've got friends, uh, Matthew from Plant Daddy Podcast. Hi. <laughs> Been trying to get me to like ficuses. I'm still trying. I'm still not there. <laughs> I like them. They don't like me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think that's that's a good bit to kind of talk a bit about what the team, what they like with the plants. And maybe if I could ask a few cheeky questions about some tips yes. from an actual grower, basically. Yeah, <laughs> hit me up for tips. <laughs> so is there one big tip that you've kind of, you could share with the audience after growing for as long as you have in these conditions? And I know before anybody says so in the comments, this is very different than what we're going to be growing yeah. at. Yeah, of course. But Kate might be able to give us some indication of things that you've learned along the way at this much of a scale because we all learn one plant at a time you're learning at how many plants at a time yeah quite a lot <laughs> yeah and I think it's just understanding I, mean, I mentioned already it's understanding your own plants needs mm -hmm. and adapting your environment where you can so yeah, yeah. for example we have already decided Sansevierias they're not going to work in here because they need so much heat mm -hmm. and we can't justify heating the glass house to that level 
just for one plant. I yeah, mean, yeah. environmentally, that's just so wrong and against yeah, yeah. all of our values. So I think it's picking the plant for the environment rather than picking a plant and working the environment around you. Mm -hmm. I mean, people talk about humidity levels. There's only so much you can do in your house. Yeah. You know, stick it in your bathroom, best yeah, yeah. place. But other than that, you're fairly limited. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's understanding your own environment in your house and picking a plant that suits suits that environment. Very, very key point. And this is the thing as well. <laughs> a lot of us don't do this. We all know this. But just a tiny bit of forethought before you buy the plant going, will it fit my space? Do I have somewhere I can put it? And it will be happy, basically. Yeah. You yeah. can still th keep things alive. <laughs> and you can move things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Once you've chosen basically. a spot doesn't mean your plant has to yeah. live there forever. Yeah. So, yeah, a, a, you be adaptable to your plants just as exactly. much as they can adapt to their environment. Exactly. And that's the thing. And I've seen there's quite a few strelitzias as well that are growing in here as well. Those are plants that start in one place. They don't ever very rarely stay in that one place because they get... They get big quickly. <laughs> Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so it is one of those things, but maybe any secret kind of tips that you've kind of learned here that maybe nobody I else might really know? Think, do you know what? I think it's, it's the world's worst kept secret. Overwatering is the worst thing you can possibly do. Yeah. You know, if in doubt, don't. Don't, yeah. And this is a thing. Oh, and actually, this is a good, good question. Oh, go you've actually brought something up now because you mentioned there's a spraying system basically yes. here and you've Based on what I'm seeing, you're growing the plants in the medium that they will probably be sold in? Yep, absolutely. So how often do you mist in here, on average? It's automated. So oh, when okay. the humidity levels do go down, the misters will kick in. Nice. And that's a really good environmental way that we can reduce water consumption mm -hmm. as well by keeping those humidity levels up. So summer months when it was that heat wave, yeah. I was walking into the glass house thinking, this is going to be horrendous. It was a beautiful environment. Oh, the nice. shades were over, the mist was on. Nice. Yeah, we managed to keep it nice and cool. Nice, nice. And that's that's important to kind of say as well, because I would imagine very rarely do plants in here go fully dry. No, you're right. Unless yeah. unless it's a very specific plant, I'm thinking, yeah. because I, I think I saw some aloes. We have some aloes, and they are kept yeah in their own bay, so we can yeah. control their environment. And they're <laughs> the ones that have the LED lights on. Yeah, from time to which time. kind of makes sense if you're talking about more succulent type plants. <laughs> yeah, you need that arid, dry environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly that. But and that's quite interesting as well because again, it means that the soil that's coming with the plants, your soil, yep, which is peat free, is good because it means that they're getting as much water as they are over here, and obviously there's a system behind it, but it means that at least it's a relatively decent growing media for them to be in. Essentially. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking that that kind of really horrible, sometimes full cocoa coir media that you get sometimes, and <laughs> it's too many people have lost plants because yes, it can be quite airy at times, but if it stays wet for too long. Yeah, and ours is, ours is coir. It, yeah. The fact is it's been recycled nice. potentially 20, 30 times. So you, it, that, that texture and that retention is, is really good as well. Good. Nice. And this is the thing, and adding things like the perlite, adding things like the slow release fertilizer, all these things make a huge difference. Yeah. yeah. Essentially, the sterilization gives us really good base, mm -hmm. which we can then adapt yeah. to the plant's needs. Yeah. And that's interesting. And I don't know, this might be a bit of a curveball, but I know there's a lot of debate online when using coir, basically, especially depending on where it's coming from. Yep. And obviously, yours has been reused as many yeah. times as it has been. But the, the worry for a lot of people that are growing at homes, they're buying, they decide, oh, does this have a lot of salt? Because there's a lot of narrative online that's happening yeah, that people are washing it within like salt water, basically. Mm -hmm. But with, I would imagine your salt has been used like over no, no, 10 no. times. Yeah, so we haven't brought any new coir for eight years. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and our real key focus is, yes, we are peat free, but our real USP is taking the waste material yeah, yeah. and recycling it. So. For example, um, we will be once the because obviously the house plants the growing media walks out the door, mm -hmm. which is different to the cut flowers that we've grown historically. But what we will then be doing is working with the soft fruit farmers, mm -hmm. so the strawberry farmers, the raspberry farmers. Oh, yeah. They do grow in virgin coir, um, and at the end of their growing season, they dispose of that coir. Yes. We will be saying, let us take that Maybe off your hands, yeah, yeah. let's sterilize it, recycle it, and off we go again. Yeah. So it more for us, it's about using what we've got rather yeah. than buying anything new in. Wonderful. And that's really cool. I think most people probably didn't realize that that is a material that's used within soft fruit farms yes. as well, actually. Yeah. 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 And this is the thing as well. 
it's it's that horrible kind of old cliche of kind of every little helps every little does help yeah. because at the end of the day if you know that your house plants that you're getting in they're reusing some of the material that's been used to grow the fruit that is on your table for instance at the yeah. moment and i think that's it people i don't think there's an awareness out there people mm. know that if you go to a garden center and you're buying a bag of com compost there's the awareness that actually peat free is the way to go yeah, yeah we need to get people questioning where the house plant has come from and what it's grown in because yes if you have a, a small nursery pot you think well that's not going to have a huge impact but when you look at the scale of where it's grown yeah, yeah. holistically it really does yeah yeah because <laughs> you're just looking at the one you're right you're looking at the one <laughs> you're yeah. looking at hundreds and thousands basically <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> trailer loads of recycled medium outside <laughs> <laughs> it makes a big difference essentially but yeah and i think one of the other things and we were talking about this before that comes up all the time from everybody and i will ask the question pests yes at this scale <laughs> pests at this scale <laughs> so we have um people working in the glass house full time they are the eyes of the glass house and they know it inside out so they are on it if we do see some pests and we try and treat it locally within the glass house initially um, and then we have an agronomist that comes in a couple of times a week. So we have experts advising us. Nice. Yes. And I think that <laughs> that's the thing that most people, because everybody asks this question, even I wanted to know as well, just like, how are they doing it? They've got experts. <laughs> At the end of the day, we can only be as expert as we possibly can in our own environments. And you, it's it's a grander scale. You're doing it at a grander scale of what people might be doing at home anyway. Yeah. Me and everybody else has always told everybody, whilst you're watering, whilst you're caring for your plants, check check for pests and early sight and early treatment is better than completely not realizing and having a massive infestation yeah. that you need to deal with yeah you can deal with a few spider mites more than you can deal with millions of spider mites so it is one of those things but yeah i think that's everything that i kind of want to touch on do you want to share anything final maybe no i think it's just spreading the word we yeah. we are here to and we our aim is to truly shake up the uk houseplant industry we want yes. people to be aware to challenge as well you know from a grower's point of view we are doing our bit but we need that conversation to come bottom up as well so yeah, yeah spread the message um and as i've already touched on it's a simple switch which only is going to make you feel better yeah exactly and that's just it as well at the end of the day touching on something that you told you kind of mentioned a moment ago was that you're kind of wanting that conversation you're wanting to learn as well you're yeah. not by any means perfect just yeah. basically but yeah, yeah and i think this is more of what we need in the health plant market generally is that kind of open dialogue yes. and more business owners would like yeah. to basically kind of having that conversation there, there's a lot of greenwashing going on out there <laughs> lots of companies talk about being sustainable and when you look into the nitty-gritty they may be using sustainable packaging mm -hmm. and that's what they're focusing on they are totally avoiding the issue of peat yeah. avoiding the issue that they're importing all of their fully mature house plants and we need to be questioning these guys exactly 100 and correct me if i'm wrong but and i don't know whether or not we've mentioned this throughout the video evan green doesn't just sell to shops you sell to individuals as well. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so we are an online marketplace. Yep. GevinGreen.co.uk is where you will I'll find add links us. Down below. <laughs> um, yeah, we have a range of about 40 different varieties on there and it's ever increasing. We've got some, some new stuff growing, which will be ready for spring. Nice. And that's, that's the big thing as well. We always talk on, on this channel about there's so many steps before a plant gets to you. Technically, yeah, this way around, we, we cut a step out entirely. Yeah, like, exactly, and, and we want to be that solution rather yeah. than just, you know, there's so much kind of environmental bashing going on, which has its place. Yeah, yeah of course. But as I said, we want to highlight the problem yeah. and, and offer the solution, yeah, which yeah. is come and buy from us. Yeah. Quite <laughs> <Wonderful>. simple. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. There's my sale spiel. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's everything I want to touch on. That's Thank great. you so much for Thanks. your time. No, it's great to have you. Amazing. And uh, I'm sure I've added clips all around and the B-roll on this video is going to be epic. <laughs> so hopefully you've all enjoyed and hopefully I shall see you all soon.